just fair warning my hormones make me feel like i could just cry yeah cry. Yeah. i think that's good for our numbers <laughs> i was gonna say it's good for the ratings just so carry cry. on carry yeah, on no, we'll, we'll include that part in here no. just so people are, are aware what what type of show we got going on here no because it's a tuesday edition here on zero block 30 and today we are dealing with some big big emotions and it's going to be fine i'm back in the booth with the, the whole squad i'm excited to tell you guys about what's been going on but for, before we get to that we do have five rounds of the magazine round number one it's time to update the old safety brief because the pilot crash is playing a couple of times and people are freaking out about it it was only seven crashes in one week. What's the big deal? Uh, I mean, if you, don't, if you don't crash at least three times a week, are you even a pilot? So People are flying? so touchy. They, they, they really are. In the pilot world, they would say that that's called being touch and go. Okay. They yeah. touch and go. Yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. Get over yourselves. <laughs> Round number two, our friends at Task and Purpose think they have the enlisted drinking culture nailed down. Well, we're going to be the judge of that because last time I checked, 23-year-old Kate doesn't work at Task and Purpose. Mm-mm. She works here. Round number three, it's not a shocking report. It, it's not a shocking report, but it should be shocking. Food insecurity is running wild in the military community. There's a growing number of military families that are struggling to just put food on the table, which is completely unsatisfactory. If we can, yeah. if we can pay $18,000 for a remote control, we should be able to pay for, oh, I don't know, food. Round number four, we have a badass of the week and it returns with a former Polish soldier. She's a 94-year-old woman named Wanda who stunned the crowd at a pro-EU rally when she thundered, be quiet, stupid boy, you lousy bastard, at a, at a member of a far-right group attempting to disrupt the gathering over a loudspeaker. And finally, round number five, in other news with the olds, we regret to inform you that they're back at it again. And by back at it again, we mean... Getting fucking elected. What's wrong with you people? Why do you keep saying yes to these senators who are like 86 years old? Who's the fucker from Iowa? Uh, what's his name? I forget his name. The, the pro tempor. This mm. dude's like 86 and just announced that he's running again. You're going to be yeah. 92. So, so many of them run Chuck uncontested. His name. So. <laughs> that old bitch. Fucking that old 86 bitch. years old. <laughs> My God. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you, Diane Feinstein? There's no shot Diane Feinstein knows where her 7-Eleven is. Zero. And I believe paperwork from her office has been put in to run again in 2024. So. Definitely has. <laughs> and that like the Democrat, she's like a sure seat if she ran against you and get elected just because people just see the letters. But even the Democrats are like, listen, Diane, you're old. You're old. You're <laughs> it a little might old. might be time to go. We need to. I don't think that was a problem when the founders laid the Constitution. They couldn't. I. They couldn't imagine people living till they're ninety years old. Yeah, people the were dying average, at like thirty-eight. Yes, the average life expectancy was like thirty something. So they didn't even really think about it. Yeah, they essentially when they put in the requirements of how old you need to be to be president, they're like, well, we don't want you to be young, but we want you to die like quickly soon after you get out of office. Who would have ever thought that somebody like Jimmy Carter would be alive fifty years after they leave office? No, fifty years. Not me. Old fucking Jimmy. Shout out. I Jimmy. did. Peanuts are great for you. Oh, yeah. Peanuts are very good for you. They're good mm-hmm. for your skin. Legumes People. in general. Legumes. The whole <laughs> legume family is very, very good for you. And what's also good for you is a little coffee in the old system. You can slam open your gullet, pour some black rifle coffee down, and you'll be on your way to have a, just a fantastic day because everybody needs their coffee, especially coffee that is brewed by a veteran owned community that's doing it. And Tennessee, Utah, they're doing it all over the damn joint. They have all kinds of coffee. If you can't find a coffee that they have and you like it, you're just not a coffee person. Just flat out not a coffee person. They have it in the can. They <laughs> they have it in the can. They have it <laughs> in the can. Get it? Like we're talking mm. butts, folks. Um, um, yeah. No, not that there's anything wrong with that. Ladies no. and fellas both enjoy a little prostate tickling. Um, I do. So we got <laughs> coffee and it's delicious. You might want to order some because they have a coffee of the month club that you can get it delivered straight to your door. Go to blackriflecoffee.com slash zero and use the promo code zero today and get the freshest coffee in the biz shipped right to you. You're going to love it. And they have the buy a bag, give a bag program too. That's going to give more and more coffee to those soldier, sailor, air force, Marines, and our favorite little space warriors. They're going to have it too. No space guardians, right? Space guardians. Yeah. Space guardians. And they also give a bag to the law enforcement, medical workers through their signature buy a bag, give a bag. So be a part of that too. Blackriflecoffee.com slash zero. So I'm back. 
listen to the show without you guys. You guys are fucking adorable. Yeah, it was Aww. just. Uh, <laughs> It was this is a in shout out defense, that you guys are giving. In, you guys are being so sweet. The difference between when I'm not on this show and not on Podfathers is monumental. Can I yeah. say one thing? Yeah, sure. I didn't. I didn't think we were recording that day. I thought that was the general consensus. And then I thought I had until one o'clock to prepare. And so it was totally a thrown together last minute show. I just was not prepared. I was in shambles, my friends. That's okay, you're doing defense. a lot of this. You're doing a lot of oversharing on the podcast. I, I, don't <laughs> I think am. You, you ended the entire last show by being, well, basically, I'm terrible at my job. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I I'm not posting anything. Too. I'm just yeah. fucking going through the motions here. We got to get that. We have to get that board marine mentality back in young Kate. And today is the start of that where we're going to rebuild no. that confidence Mm-mm. that she needs so much. No, nope. we're going to rebuild. We're going to improvise, adapt and overcome. And Kate is going to be the one who's on badass of the week on Friday because she mm. is going to fly past her own expectations for herself. I'm excited for this week. It's a great week to be Katie Mannion. What a week. What a Everything week. is terrible. <laughs> we're all going to die. Oh, no. and Kaz is doing great in his hat too. Kaz, I got to say, I don't think we've talked about it on the show. But I have to commend you. You made a fantastic choice and just trimming all the hair off your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks hey, great. Take your hat yeah. off. Let me see. Let's see it. It looks Whoa, fantastic. Looks it looks so great. much better. You look younger. You look 10 years younger. Oh, that looks your hair. very good. Thanks, yes, thanks. Yeah, that, very that, nice. Those curly locks just uh, they weren't growing all the places that I needed them to grow. So I just kind of took it down. It's a lot easier to maintain, obviously, too. Yeah, so. well, I wish that would happen with the pubes. <laughs> <laughs> The pubes will, they'll yeah. still keep somebody coming. in our apartment clogged the shower recently and Pat's out you. of town. So <laughs> how do you fix that? Oh, uh, manscape probably just yeah. wait till we have that read come back up again. <laughs> we'll bring it up. Kate at that time. And it won't be inappropriate because you did it to yourself, uh, <laughs> which is nice. I went out to California and was hanging out with my buddies. Going to the ball was fantastic. I was, I had a few little, Adult beverages. I was chilling, having a couple glasses of wine with all the Marines afterwards. It was over. And then I just did my old thing and wandered into the kennels and was just playing with all the work. I noticed dogs. that. It I noticed was fantastic. that. My, uh, my buddy Doc was like, dude, are you stupid? Like, you can get hurt. I was like, Doc, this, this is not my first rodeo around these puppies. I know what I'm doing. It's not like I'm going to go in there without any type of equipment on. I just went in there and was just talking to him at the little fence. Hey, Bubbles, how you doing, little Bubbles? Ooh, ooh, ooh. And they were so happy, like just being around Malinois when they were spinning and jumping and licking my hand and just having a great time. One of them shit to get my attention. I wasn't paying attention to him. He took a big old dump. I was like, I see you over there taking a dump, getting attention. You little I, fucking cutie. I noticed that guy looked like he was your long lost friend and hadn't seen you and he was excited to see you. It's the praise voice. Even Doc said he was like, your praise voice still on point. Doc has a dog. He adopted this dog from Mexico and they have like this program in san diego where a woman had started it where she would go down to mexico and get these foster dogs that were in kill shelters down there and bring them back and she was doing it all on her own dime and doc was actually the first dog that she adopted out and this dog is scaredy cat like when you talk about a dog that is nervous nelly him Mm. so i walk in to doc's apartment lando and usually dogs love me right away they can just kind of sense like oh this is the guy the dog guy and i put my hands out for him to come see me he's like oh no <laughs> not this redheaded fuck <laughs> he runs into the kitchen puts his back against the sink and he's like Aww. please do not talk to me for a long time so i just kind of let him be and, and relax and by the end of the time he was putting his head in my lap and i was able to pet his head and chill with him and everything but these dogs man if you're a person who is cruel to animals I fucking hate you. Same. Like just, just even if you talk to a mean, why? They just want to make you happy, and then you can fuck them up for the rest of their lives. Doc's gonna have to do so much work to get this puppy back. But anyways, talking to the Marines is fantastic. Being around those, I got to see one of Kate's old sergeants that was there, and she's now in the position yeah. of being the provost sergeant. That kind of shit made me feel old. That my friends are in the position one to invite me to the ball. And somebody that Kate worked with is now a provost sergeant, which is the senior enlisted advisor for all the the PMO, which is basically the MPs on base. But it was a great time. I loved it. Yeah, it's crazy to see your friends with a huge rank on their collar. Like, whoa, when did that happen? I I used to be total shitheads. A gunny? What are we doing here? Yeah, Yeah. I got. I have friends about to make colonel. It's pretty ridiculous. And then I have other friends that are prepping to take over battalions, which is a little wild to think about. 
Oh yeah. Um, Which some of the officers have listened to the show that was there to like the Lieutenant colonels and colonels just to make sure I was a safe personality to have come and speak to their Marines. And they're like, we're taking a risk here, please. <laughs> I was like, I no, Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. I appreciate yeah, the were. leeway. Um, yeah. You know, what's interesting about you chaps. I know you well enough now I can always, I could basically tell you if I read your texts and or tweets, I could tell you how many drinks you've had at that point. Yeah. Just based on the content. No, no tone, nothing. I can tell you exactly how much. Yeah. And I think that I, cause I hardly ever drink anymore. I usually just Mm -hmm. three cheat goof. So when I do, even like if I have like now my three glasses of wine, three or four glasses of wine used to be my like three or four bottles of wine. So Mm -hmm. like the difference when I go someplace like that, it's like, oh shit, that hit me a lot faster than I was used to. Like when you Mm -hmm. don't drink hardly ever, and then you do drink, you feel like a little boot again, it's, but oh, it's also yeah. kind of nice, honestly, because you don't have to just pound whiskeys all night. You could just take a couple of sips of wine and you're like, I'm feeling good. Yeah, I have to say I got the baby back from I was down at my parents two hour drive last night. And in the end, it was really stressful. He was like screaming the last 30 minutes and I finally get him down and I never, ever do this. I said, I think I'm going to have a glass of wine. And it was like a healthy pour, but not huge. And that was all I needed. I used to be Katie, the old Katie wines a lot, would drink like a bottle and a half and be like, oh, I probably should do two more bottles. I, this was, I had a full Call that a chap's I, visit to New York. I almost <laughs> went to pour another one and I was like, no, I feel like I'd be sick if I had it. Like it was the perfect, it was very delightful to have a little Katie buzz a lot going off one big glass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My buddy was like, do you want to go out and just kind of day drink all day? I was like, absolutely not. No, like, no we, <laughs> we drank yesterday. What do you mean? Like, I don't well, want to do that again today. So we ended up just going golfing and hanging out there and just telling, he was just telling me stories about what it was like really. And for staff and CEOs in the recruiting world Yeah, during COVID, I had no idea, man. Like we, we talk about the military issues all the time. Imagine being where your entire performance is based on who you can get into the office when you're not allowed to have people in the office. Yeah, it's a little bit of a hindrance. Like the military suicide rates attempts for recruiters. I was I was doing a little research on it. An unbelievable increase. And that job field is already very stressful being a recruiter, like getting people in 600 percent increase in suicide attempts from recruiters during the covid times. Because and they mean, thought that their well, careers were over. Yeah, I mean that that also goes up to their leadership too. Like they have. Oh, to definitely. Understand. Yeah, it goes top down. But you right. know what the issue is that we couldn't have. They had to pause essentially a lot of the boot camp classes that were going in. The Marine Corps is designed, like we talked about last week, where eighty percent of those who enlist on the first time get out. So you have people getting out and no, and not nearly as many coming back in. So you have to keep the pressure on. You yeah. know f- for certain. For certain, President Trump wasn't going to put in stop loss and say that we're struggling to do something militarily and we need Mm. to put people can't get out if they want to. That wasn't going to happen on his leadership. And Biden sure shit ain't going to do it the moment that he steps into office and put in a stop loss in place whenever everybody thinks he's basically a socialist dictator anyways. So (laughs) you're just not going to have it. So then who takes the brunt? It's the junior troops again, like always. It's the junior troops who takes the fucking brunt of it ridiculous yeah. ridiculous Crazy. yeah and, and too often the, the response is yeah we know it sucks but just do it anyway mm-hmm. yeah that's essentially what went down like some yeah. people would be they would get sent by their commands to go to mental health treatment inpatient get released and be told to be back at work 24 hours later to get going again yeah, yeah it's just not right. crazy it's yeah not i right. mean i guess the old adage is true mission accomplishment and then troop welfare like that's yeah. the order that it goes and that's the order that it's taught and they yeah they but- stuck by their fucking guns I am so glad, though, that you got to go see your friend. Like we could tell from your text, you were like a puppy running around, like like just that great. Well, there was happy puppies energy. around, so that's all. That and there was helps. puppies around. So, yeah, that was that we were happy for you. Yeah. Good and stuff. San Diego never sucks. No, True. it doesn't. It doesn't suck at all. Um, all right. Let's get into the actual rounds today. Round number one. We have a pilot who crashed seven times. And I thought when I saw this, I was like, there's no way how is this possibly true but then it went through because the the first one i saw was from like a wkfr which is just a radio station sometimes they might get duped but it was actually sourced from the ap they had it sourced from the ap and that's where it all came down kate why don't why don't you walk us through what happened on these flights all right so if you survive one plane crash in your lifetime you're considered pretty lucky when you survive seven in one week not traveling with you uh, licensed pilot Dennis Collier was proud, was the proud new owner of an amphibious airplane called the Sea Wind 3000. 
He went to California to check out the beautiful aircraft that had not been flown for years. In fact, the aircraft only had a total of 20 hours of flying in its entire lifetime. That's like nothing. RecordEagle.com did an amazing job of breaking down, please excuse the pun, each of these seven plane crashes that took place with this new plane in four states over the span of seven days. Here's a brief summary. Crash number one. The first of the seven crashes happened attempting to land after a test flight in California. The landing gear was still up. This banged up the plane pretty good, but no injuries. Crash number two. The engine stalled out, causing the plane to come down hard beside a runway in New Mexico, taking out a sign and runway lights. Again, no injuries. Crash number three. We know for sure that this crash also took place at the same airport in New Mexico as crash number two. But nobody's really sure what happened. Just another <laughs> crash. Uh, crash number four. After leaving New Mexico and being in the air for a couple hours, more problems arose. At this point, you're absolutely insane. After the first time, I would not be getting back in this plane. I think the first time you're like, okay, this plane hasn't crashed for a while. Like, let's give it another go. This is You're on attempt four now. Yeah. So in attempt, seven days. Attempt four, he leaves New Mexico. He's in the air for a couple hours. And then the left wing hinged tab got stuck and the plane was pitching up. It took all the pilot's strength to control the aircraft and four attempts to land. That That's landing, my last one. Like once that happens and I'm, I have to use all like the, my yeah. strength to get down for me, that's it. And yeah. I, it's shocking. Like, if, you know, if you watch a lot of UFC, even if a fighter wins, they can like sustain a little bit of an injury where the Nevada's athletic commission will say, you know what? You can't fight for a time period of six months. You're suspended for six months. It's shocking that there's not that in place for a plane crash. Like you would think, a plane crash is a little more severe than the NFL concussion protocol. Like if you get, if you crash once, you got to sit out a week. You crash twice, we're moving it to a month. Three times in a week, buddy, that's a year. Four time, get out. You don't get to you, fly. You can get out. You just get out of here. You take yeah. your little pilot wings and you get out. Well, he didn't get out. Didn't. Uh, crash number five. He makes some repairs and he performs a test flight that ends in another crash in Nebraska. Crash number six. The, Imagine this is being terrifying. his spouse and he calls you and he's like, honey, <laughs> fifth time wasn't the charm. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to believe it, but I'm taking the kids up. My, my good luck charms on this one. So <laughs> yeah. we'll see. Um, it's crash number six. The hydraulic pressure gauge was registering zero. So the fuel gauge showed an uneven supply. He radioed to the airport to ask whether there was a spotter on the ground who could look up as he passed and let him know if the landing gear was down. Got no response. The nose hit during landing. The plane skidded down the runway in Michigan. Crash number that's seven. What, how does nobody respond? You got to imagine that's a pretty vital job, like being an air traffic controller, to be like, hey, I'm not sure if I'm going to die or not seems like one that you should answer like i kate we know you're not the best at answering your text i right. can do it too where i don't answer text cons you answer everybody even like the the fucking your body or your car loan people your extended warranty folks yeah. you'll, you'll even answer those people but going through you gotta say hey i'm gonna stop what i'm doing go outside see if i see any wheels down yeah, that's uh, that's a tough look right there. Maybe they were in the bathroom, but you'd think they'd have a backup. Oh, yeah, so the I wonder, no problem. You just I, stay in there and do your business. Yeah, I wonder if this story. is like such a remote area that maybe that they kind of work in shifts and there wasn't anybody in the tower at that time. But you can't do that. Uh, Even if no, you're remote, yeah. you got to have fire watch. Somebody's got to yeah. be on plane fire watch. Mm -hmm. Well, it, there's one more crash. Number seven, the week long nightmare ended. On the 4th of July in Lake Michigan. I don't like how they use the preposition in there. Yeah, <laughs> in Lake Michigan. In Lake mm. Michigan. Since the C-1-3000, C-Wind-3000 had so many issues with the landing gear deploying, the pilot promised the FAA. So the FAA is even aware this guy's still flying around, which is uh, wild that they were allowing it. At I'm sorry, point. shame on the FAA. that They're like, wait, you really promise? You like, you cross your heart and hope to die promise? Okay, all right, that's good enough for us. Go ahead. So he promised the FAA that he would keep his landing gear down for the entire 25 minute flight. He did not know when he made the promise that he would be doing an emergency water landing due to the wing flaps, not responding. Oh, classic Let me kiss tell to you, the flaps, not responding. When your flaps, uh, yes, you always want your flaps to be on the ready. And yeah, when they're and not. Now, now his flaps are all wet, which usually isn't bad, but. It's not great. And when a, when a strong enough wind blows through them. Oh. 
<laughs> Buddy, stuff. call that a queef. Yeah. <laughs> call that a queef. <laughs> <laughs> the landing gear. He essentially had a plane queef. Is, yeah, he did. Is, yeah an, aer- an aerial queef. Mm-hmm. The landing gear causes the plane to go vertically into the water nose first. Uh, nose Somehow, first into a plane queef. Right? Into a Goodness plane queef. It's gracious. Queef. Squee! Anyway, the, he, somehow he remained uninjured once again. The plane, though, is now at the bottom of Lake Michigan. That's so probably there's where not going to be an eighth day. That's good. No, he went. That's so probably he went for the to best. What did he do all that work for? Work. <laughs> I would, I would Seems say like nothing. he didn't do anything. I would say he, nothing. Did he, he do that much work? If you yeah. crashed seven times, you didn't do a whole lot of work. You, you no, but didn't really pay too much attention to that maintenance it seems that's like. a lot of scary crashes to get to like maybe it, maybe the plane itself since it was like a used plane maybe it was cheaper than a flight back home oh it has so to be. He was like, it's a repo plane that he's trying to get up and yeah. i understand that like as somebody who enjoys bulk trash day just because i drive around and see if there's anything that i might need or can repurpose i enjoy that and if you if i found a plane sitting on the side of the road buddy you better believe i'm trying to get that thing going yeah, I mean, it said it only had 20 hours of flight time, which is absolutely next to nothing for a plane. I wonder if that was inaccurate. And then number two, part of me Rolling thinks- Rolling it back is, like they had that plane up on bricks and they had yeah. it going in reverse. <laughs> yeah, Ferris Bueller style. And that didn't actually work. But I wonder too, if this was like a very elaborate insurance fraud scheme where he was just trying to get the insurance mm. for this crash plane. It's like, ah, see, I did all this work. Well, if it's, it's crashed, you would have to imagine it's kind of like a crash car where eventually they put like a lemon license on it where you yeah. can't get the insurance. Yeah, there's a lot of people to blame here. I, I wonder how much is the plane and how much it's pilot error. You got to blame the FAA. I, I, I feel like, like you said at the top, one crash and you should be on the ground minimum six months. Minimum, I think. I'm blaming this guy. You got to have that. It's it's good initiative, bad judgment. You see a plane, you want to take the plane after your third crash. You just got to say, maybe I need a better plane. Yeah, I'm looking so. up what he looks like right now because Dave. I can already Oh, look at him. Oh, my God. He absolutely. This guy is uh, is crashed in planes. I know this isn't good for the listeners at all, but put in we'll the ZBT it. group chat right now. Look at this fucking guy. This is a guy. To those who can't see him, who you see at the back of a Jimmy Buffett tailgate, just fucking hammered, fucking this, drunk. This guy looks exactly what I thought he was going to look. Minus, I, I would have expected a big mustache, but otherwise, yeah, he looks. And I don't want to say it, but this guy looks like an absolute booze bag. Yeah. I was gonna say, <laughs> Chaps, I was just going to say, this guy looks like he doesn't miss happy hour any day. No, that's a booze bag face if I ever seen it. And we like him. But, buddy, those things don't go together. When you have the bulbulous alcoholic nose and a, a pilot's license, you got to pick one or the other. Yeah, yeah. you got to mm. pick one or the other. God That's bless That's a safety brief. All right, let's move on to round number two, which, apropos enough, we're going to be talking a little bit about drinking because our folks at Task and Purpose, they put out what each one of the uh, enlisted ranks are going to be <sighs> drinking, most likely if you find them. The first up is obviously that beautiful E1, the little babies. For us, it's private. What's your else? basic private, right? Isn't that mm-hmm. it? You want mm-hmm. basic private? Mm-hmm. Um, so they said that water is the choice of for that. And I would disagree. I would I disagree. disagree. I disagree with wholeheartedly. This too. And I think that the drinks one, if they're E1 through E, probably very first three months of being an E3 would be Monster Energy or Red Bull or Rip It. Like it is not going to be water. Or On their own, now. if you give it to an E1 and E2 and they're out of boot camp, they're not drinking water. It's energy drink automatically. But also, like, you know, I, I get I'm sure they have some uh, edi- editorial duties here to, to not encourage underage drinking. But let's not act like these kids aren't the same as college kids. They're going to. Oh, be no, we go E2. They go straight to the booze for E2. No. Yeah. But I would. So even when we were in MOS school and we were baby boots, when we got the chance to go out in town for a lot of that. Now, I was a college dropout, so I had the college experience. But for a lot of these young military members, this is their college. So yeah. I, there was a lot of dead serious. There was a ton of Mad Dog, Boone's Farm. Mm-hmm. Like there was like men in there. I got hammered on Long Island iced teas at a Chili's. There was I had so no idea many... that it was liquor. I thought it was actual tea with like vodka in it. <laughs> yep. I had no Long idea Island what was going on teas. in it. There's a blue version on the West Coast that everybody always drank. I forget what it's called, but there was, yeah, Long Island teas, Mad Dogs and Hypnotic and Hennessy. Mm. Something like that. But I mean, though, and Hennessy was another huge one, another mm. huge one. But yes, that was what we were just the, the, just the cheapest, 
most disgusting booze out there. A lot of 40s, the cheapest probably. booze that was high alcohol content. Yes, yeah. exactly. And yeah. usually it was something disgusting, like a lemon vodka or like oh. a or wild apple vodka. One of those flavor yeah. vodkas that's not like our beloved Pink Whitney. Which is no, it's not Pink Whitney, and it's not New Amsterdam in general. But do you remember those cake flavored vodkas? Yes, yes, dude. Like oh, when yes. I got out of boot camp, that was the drunkest I ever been. It was on the wild, I think it was wild cherry or something like that. And I thought that Smirnoff only made like Smirnoff ice. I thought it was like mm-hmm. a Smirnoff ice with a different flavor. So I was chugging that shit. Ended up so drunk that my buddy uh, shaved or waxed my pubes in his bathtub and then drugged me under a mattress and I scratched my face with staples. It was bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Oh, so the E2. Didn't need to hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> the E2s, they are dealing with Keystone Light. Keystone Light all day, every day. A private first class is a boot. Everybody knows it except him. And if he didn't, he wouldn't care. In their own eyes, boots are hard charging war fighters with a cool new haircut, no real bills, and hopefully many, many backpacks. I would say I do agree with Keystone Light, but I with a little trepidation because a lot of times you don't even see the young boots with beer. Usually it's going to be something i remember one that we would do outside the barracks all the time just buy a two liter of dr pepper empty out like a third of it and fill it back up with captain morgan yeah mm. yeah you know That's you also see special. you know what else is a boot special putting booze in their camelback oh yeah booze in yeah. the camelback um and when we did drink beer even when we were like e1 e2 e3 we would normally get like Bud Light or Budweiser because we, you were throwing in, you would, everybody we'd all throw in together and try and get something a little nicer than the college beers, at least in Bud my Heavy unit. was big. Bud PBR Heavy was, was huge. big. Like yeah, anything. PBR. Oh, and also Okinawa was huge on Miller High Life, like just mm, the, the yeah. straight up full flavored Miller, which mm-hmm. I, I mean, looking back now, I've gone so far the other way. When I first got out of the Marine Corps, I was a big craft beer guy where I was looking at IPAs and styles and things like that. Now get those out of my face. I just, if I'm going to have beers, just make it a light beer and I'll drink them all day and not feel a thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I remember because I had never done a craft beer or anything. I was in the Marines out in California at a bar and I was like, I'm feeling fancy. I'm going to order one of these. It's called, it's called Blue Moon. And they put an orange. My dad came out to visit. I was like, dad, they put an orange slice on this fucking beer. You don't fruit the beer. <laughs> what? Now, I had no idea it was owned by like Budweiser. It was just a regular you old it was crap. beer. It's so thought, disappointing yeah. when you find out that one of those big brands is a chain, like something that you really like. You're like, man, there's this little spot here. It's called Chipotle. Oh my God. That's I how I felt that. when I came back from Okinawa because they weren't a thing. And then I came back and they're in San Diego. And I called my mom. I was like, mom, there's this taco place out here that's unbelievable. <laughs> Just wait till you find it. They do these little things called burrito bowls. Holy shit. Wait you know, till America fail and figures these bad boys out. <laughs> my <laughs> uncle came out to California for work and he was staying two hours north of the base. And he was like, let's meet halfway for dinner. I was like, no, no, no. I know it's a long drive for you on a work night. You got to come down to Oceanside. There is this wacky ass, crazy ass seafood restaurant that's going to blow your fucking mind, dude. And he was like, all right. He comes down. It was Joe's Crab Shack. I didn't oh know. My God. <laughs> I didn't know. It was that's a not, and that's not new either. That's been around a long time. I had time. never seen it before. We're going like, to go to this place and they have unbelievable chicken. And for oh, some reason, there's some, there's some nights there and they have, they do like sword battles and shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, I've it's, never it's heard called of it. medieval times. You're going to really love it. Yeah, he, he pulled up. He was like, are you serious? We have one of these in our mall back in Indiana. I was like, what? Get the oh, fuck that's out. a stunt. He didn't even need to stun on you like that. Saying yeah. that they have that's a nice mall in Indiana to have a Joe's Crab Shack. My yeah, goodness. a lot of Joe, big chain. Who knew? Big, big chain. Yeah. All right. Number three the, for the old Lance Corporal with the um, PV uh, private, just straight up private in the army. They have Southern Comfort. So Southern Comfort. They say "fuck this shit." The first word out of almost every single E3's mouth when someone asks how they like the military, followed by a long, deep swig of Dr. Pepper and some Southern Comfort. I feel like that one's true. But instead of "fuck that shit," I would say that almost all of those type of service members say "living the dream." Yeah, yeah that's the one the they dream. go with. Oh, how I hate, are you? I hate oh, living that. the dream. People got that. really into Jack. Oh, that was too big. You all the guys with the dip cans in their pocket and the Jack Daniels uh, and they would make all sorts of Jack Daniel mixes with lemonade country time lemonade mix. And Jack Daniels was like a thing for some reason. Oh yeah. What is that? That's called the um, fucking John Daly. Yeah. No, John John Daly's uh, uh, normal Palmer with vodka. 
So mm. lemonade and iced tea and vodka. Oh, no, that one's a Tom Collins. No, that's gin. I don't know what it is. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> whatever all right anyway. e4 we got the e4 and they are just starting to get into a little bit of the bottom shelf of whiskey like jim bean jack daniels johnny walker and jameson yeah. i agree with that totally jameson that is... all fucking day passing just passing the bottle Soco shots at the bar yep so uh, soco and blueberry soco schnapps. And soco and blueberry schnapps southern blues we'll take 15 southern blues over here please yeah, and then three of us one. are gonna get the dui together <laughs> Well, no, they're saying here. Oh, that was something from the ball this weekend too. My buddy was because he he's the ops chief there, and we wake up the next day. We we went to bed at like fucking ten o'clock. It was ridiculous. Like we're so old that we just went back to his place and left at like nine. Left the ball at nine, and we're just. I was like, I'm tired. It's ten o'clock. I'm going to fuck to sleep. The next day, I woke up. I was like, How was your night? Anything happened? And he was like, no, he's like, none of the Marines got in trouble. He's like, there's not a single Marine on the blotter report on the Marine Corps birthday ball for the entirety of Miramar, which is Pussies. fantastic news. I know. What is a soft ass? I blame core. the local generals for that. Like, what is that? Mm. If you have a Marine Corps ball with no DUIs, honestly, I think the colonel in charge of the base will probably get like an MSM, like sure. a mandatory service medal for yeah. that. Yep. Like, because that is a pretty big accomplishment that yeah. all your safety brief took effect and nobody got in trouble. Pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Pretty mm. good. Also shows that they're not fucking around about kicking people out. Everybody's True. like, no, they actually will right now. Yeah. Even if we don't get a shot, they'll kick us out. So if we get drunk and get a DUI, we're definitely the fuck out of here. Um, E5. Well, I'm sorry. I just want to talk about this real quickly because I think you guys glossed over it a little bit. At E4, they say drinking is more competitive and, and then saying like, I can drink more than you and take more shots than you and, oh, and yeah. just be completely fine. And everybody knows if you just keep drinking, you're not going to be fine. But that's yeah. very much, uh, you know, you make it to E4 get a little bit of a little bit more rank and you get competitive about your drinking. Oh, I think that that should start from the very beginning. Too. It started with me from the very beginning. It's because especially being the, like usually the only woman in the like hanging out drinking, it was mm. uh, watch how much I could chug. And my thing was the car bombs. The And well, you I had could, your every- time set up from school. You you were still kind of rugby Katie. Oh, I could oh, yeah. I could out chug anybody. So I'd always challenge people to chugging. You contests. do a good job still. Like whenever we go oh. places of chugging a beer, I can't do it. I am terrible at shotgunning beers. I could do I you could probably put two beers in a two story funnel right now and I'd take it down. No problem with like zero problem. Anyway, no problem. Zero problem. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> e- E5, the short lived craft beer stage, starting to tend to be in no shit leadership position by this time. And what they keep telling themselves that they're going to have something a little bit more fancy that usually comes from a local brewery with an IPA. They nailed this one. E5 mm-hmm. is that is when you're starting, you're like, I'm going to be start to be an adult. I'm going to be oh, a little what bit was more that? mature. There was this beer bar in San Diego that had like 500 different kinds of beers. And that's where all the Stone? sergeants. No, it was like down in San Diego, but it had like all and everybody would go and get like the big oh, flying beers. saucer. I don't remember. It wasn't a brewery. It was like a big beer restaurant that like that was on the weekend. We'd all go down there. And like once and we were like sergeants, and corporals stuff all and, over the walls. I don't know. Knick knacks, like, whatever. Beers. Anyway, Listen, yes. drink whatever you want to drink. I don't I don't really care. But I, it's these people who they like are just new into the craft beer stage of their life. So they think that somehow their palate is, is more advanced and they order their craft beer and what have you. And then I order a Miller Lite and they kind of scoff at you like, OK, OK, light beer guy like that. There's mm-hmm. something wrong with that. Just like I'm not going to make fun of you for having a fancy beer. Don't make fun of me for ordering a light beer. Who gives a shit? Well, with that said. These motherfuckers don't realize that they're destroying their palate with these beers. Yeah. Like IPAs. If you drink a hoppy enough IPA enough, I did it where I couldn't hardly taste anything else. <laughs> like where it, I'd call to have an IPA mouth where I started to hate my normal favorite thing. It was like being on meth, honestly. <laughs> like where totally, like, yeah, I totally. used to love, I used to love lasagna and now I hate it because I had so many hoppy IPAs. Don't do those. That's a, it's a slippery slope. IPAs mm-hmm. are a slippery slope. Because next thing you know, you're doing double IPAs. IPAs and lasagna is a wild fucking move, chaps. It's a wild <laughs> fucking move. Not at the same time. At different okay, times. Okay, okay. You know? I, I mean, love I a nice IPA and a hot I wasn't lasagna. having Super Nona over to have some okay. lasagna and then chug it down. She wouldn't let you in the house for that IPA if you brought that in. No, mm-hmm. I, if I was going to hang out, you know I'm having a full-bodied red. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
like something mm. probably something from sicily honestly if we're mm-hmm. being completely honest e6 let's see what they got there this is whenever you start to get into bourbons they say it's going to be low level bourbons but just a little bit elevated from jim beam like an evan williams i think that's spot on e7 is when you just drink all day and you have it in your coffee cup i could not agree more with that this he- also is when i started that was the rank that when we were in drinking situations i started seeing cigars pop up oh yeah that's they're a good starting point. to feel themselves starting mm-hmm. to feel a little fancy in the bridges and it'd be like a bourbon with a cigar or whatever it's either that a cigar or it's the person who's just been in for way too long and marble lights and even marble reds don't do it for them so now mm-hmm. they're just smoking straight up newports from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed <laughs> but still running a 300 pft like 100. somehow yeah, true. yeah somehow yeah and their mm-hmm. uniform constantly smells like shit Yes. Even though they mm-hmm. bitch at everybody else about it. It's like, you don't smell yourself. You smell like gunny you just, rolls. You walked out of my ass is how you smell. <laughs> yeah. um, Master sergeants have a flask on them at all times because the beer in their coffee mug no longer does the trick. I think that that's fair too. By the time you're an E9, you're just typically a raging alcoholic and they end up with the master gun sergeant major ranks being just a straight up bottle of brown liquor that nobody can identify, but they just know it's very, very strong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember having to clean out the company office on Fridays. Like, you know, you'd have to go through and like go into your CEO's office and the higher enlisted ranks and cleaning out the trash can of some of the offices and just finding like old, like liquor bottles and beer cans in the trash cans and be like, Oh, in the office. Whoa, I didn't know. Oh yeah. I used to love that Mm -hmm. shit. That was my, that's where liquor cabinet music playlist came from. At the end of the day, we would send the Marine home and then talk about what we're going to do the next week. By the way, I talked to Lugo on Marine Corps birthday ball. Yeah. Hey guys, how you doing? Did I, get I it? called him up. I was like, hey, man, I'm in California. Holy shit, Catherine, <laughs> happy birthday, dog. Good to see you. Because I faced him. He's like, hold on. Let me pull over to the side of the road. I'm, I'm fucking driving here. Don't want to be dangerous. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> I um, asked him. I was like, why don't you come out after the bong and get a drink with me and Doc? Because he knew him, too. He's like, yeah. I love to, but I got an early morning tomorrow, dog. We got, we got Little League going on. We got all kinds Aww. of stuff. I can't get out of the house right now. Hit me up next time. That's what he says every <laughs> Good time. Good man. Good man. I like that. I like that. Just one. I like one, it how he still doesn't have time for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, absolutely not. Like, I realize you live in Texas. I got Little League, dude. I got bigger yeah. things going on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're just never here, but still, Little League is taking yeah, precedence here. Uh-huh. Um, one thing that was conspicuously absent from this list, at no point did I see wine. Yeah, because it's not a big enlisted drink, man. Like, if Mm-mm. you drink, no. if you drink wine as an enlisted person, you're viewed as like a weirdo. Mm, I don't okay. think I ever saw if you roll down to the smoke pit on a Friday night with a bottle of wine, it it, it has to be a joke. Now. Do you think it is? Somebody tell us God, if you're what a power in the move that would be circle. just to go down to the smoke pit with like a cab soft with a yeah. fine Chianti. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, nobody ever did that. You would be looked at if like they you did were it was like weirdo. port wine. I do remember there were some weirdos that have like port <laughs> wine. Yeah, but it was never a good wine. I yeah. don't really like port. No, me either. No. I don't like yeah. that at all. All right, let's move on to round number three. Today, we're going to be talking about an unbelievable badass, and that is going to be brought to you by our good friends at Bear Bottom Clothing. If you haven't tried it out, they're so comfortable. They sent me a new package of their new stuff. Their T-shirts are unbelievably soft. They have these. I, I wore them. Doc even commented on them when I got off the plane. They have these joggers. And you guys know me, I have super skinny ankles. So I've always felt like I couldn't be a jogger guy because they basically like highlight your ankles. Mm -hmm. I still look dynamite. I felt like a million bucks walking around. They're the perfect plain pants because everybody looks good in them. Everybody looks good in them. You look good in them. You feel good. This is why I say it's perfect plain pants because being on a plane in sweatpants, sure, you're going to be very comfortable, but you also don't know if you're going to be hot as shit. Because it could be steamy on that plane and that sweatpants, you're just going to be having all kinds of moistness go on in and around your dick and flaps. With these bad boys, you have the comfort of jeans. They're a little bit cooler because they're the joggers. And because it has like a little bit of elastic in the waistline, you don't even have to wear a belt. So you don't even have to Mm -hmm. take it off when you're going through TSA. Huge news. So if you want to get some of this and their bathing suits, all that kind of stuff that they have it as well, make sure you check it out. Go to barebottomclothing.com to get 10% off your first order with uh, the promo code zero and also spend 150 bucks and you're going to get a free tea. Easy day there. Make sure you go to barebottom.com 
Use the promo code zero for 10% off. Let's get going with the story that absolutely fired me the fuck up. Let's go with this story out of Poland. It fired me up when I saw it because there's something about, one, how the women who were very instrumental in World War II and the victory therein are kind of overlooked throughout history, even though that some of the behind the scenes stuff, some of the secret stuff, the it really was super, super dangerous for them to be involved. And they did it anyway. And they did it knowing that most likely there was never going to be a time where they got any thanks for it. They're going to do it just because they thought it was the right thing to do. This is one of those stories. And this little woman seems like she's an absolute firecracker. Kate, what do we got here? Here we go. Wearing a military beret and a Polish wartime resistance armband, 94-year-old Wanda Trazik stalska stunned the crowd at a pro-EU rally when she thundered, be quiet, stupid boy, you lousy bastard, and a member of a far-right group attempting to, to disrupt the gathering over a loudspeaker. Uh, when you throw bastard around in the right way, it really does just slap, mm -hmm. you know. Be a quiet, slap. stupid boy, you bastard. lousy bastard. Yes. Despite her advancing years and tiny stature, the Warsaw Uprising veteran has lost none of her fighting spirit when it comes to defending Poland's presence in the European Union and migrant rights. Tens of thousands of people have turned out in October in support of Poland's EU membership after the con Constitutional Court contested the primary of EU law, which experts saw as a step towards poll exit. The, given the nationalist ruling party's Euro skepticism, a lot of words there. Just know mm -hmm. there's Good a job, lot going on there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that was almost like reading numbers for me. That was very difficult. I'm a I soldier. See Kate's eyes started to roll back in her head. And she's like firing so. them with like Euro, Euro, Euro uh, skepticism. Uh, pulse, what the fuck? Uh, got it. <laughs> pull, pull exit. Uh, well, you crushed uh, it. Thank you. I'm a soldier. I tell it like it is, Trazik Stauska said while smiling coyly as she took a sip of tea from her home in Warsaw filled with Polish and EU flags. Trazik Stauska was a 12-year-old girl guide when the German army invaded Poland. She joined the resistance movement and went on to carry out acts of sabotage under the sweet pseudonym of Donut. At the awesome. Man. Two things. Yep. Two things. Man. Number one. The fact that she still considers herself a soldier, which she very much is, I think is fantastic. Most people just see that as a part in their life and move on from that. She's like, no, no, I'm still a soldier. And then number two, the fact that she was 12 and said, yes, yeah, sign me up for some sabotage. Let's yep. get it. That's but awesome. we do have something to talk about, and I don't like to bring it up, but I feel like I owe it to the listener to do it. I understand why the name Donut is so great, but she says several times how small she is. You got to go with Munchkin in that situation right. like you right. just absolutely Donut have hole. to yeah that mm -hmm. would have been much better um and they had so many dunkin donuts around then as they well really so did. it's silly that they didn't they really did uh, they the love outbreak, kolaches in love kolaches huge kolache folks at the outbreak of the warsaw uprising on august 1st 1944 she was one of fifty thousand fighters to revolt against the nazis as well as a rare girl with a machine gun an assignment usually reserved for men at the time 12 so, years old with a machine gun yeah <laughs> over the course of six and that has to be perfect for crushing nazi morale too to get half your oh, unit yeah. taken out by a 12 year old girl named donut up by a 12 year old girl named donut yeah you they might call as well it just getting, pack it up. yeah you gotta <laughs> quit you gotta just quit yeah uh that was the real icing on the cake there for that unit. Yeah, exactly icing right on Kate. The donut. how is she course, gonna kill you in an assorted a variety of methods she sprinkled them with, uh, mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. okay, over the course of 63 days of battle, nearly 200,000 civilians and fighters died and the city was reduced to rubble. Trazik Stauska later passed through four German prisoner of war camps before Polish forces operating in the Netherlands and Germany freed her from a camp in Northwest Germany in 1945. Once back home, she worked as a teacher for handicapped children. The last order she received, her life's mission, has been to watch over the cemetery bearing the remains of nearly half of the wartime dead found in the ruins of the Polish capital. Remaining in the EU is a question of national security. Were we to quit the Union, where would that leave us, she asked. We already know what 1939 was like. It's our greatest danger. We end, we'd end up like a fly against an elephant, she said, her robust voice contrasting with her fragile frame. She said she was furious at the rally when she chose to call out the far right, who have received funding from the state and plan to go ahead with a march through Warsaw uh, on Poland's Independence Day. A controversial march, which has drawn upwards of 10,000 people in past years, has often turned violent and been the subject of intense legal wrangling. I got up on stage to speak of the Poland of our dreams, 
us veterans of the uprising, a Poland that is kind and tolerant, she added. She soon received death threats. The Polish government has adopted a hardline approach imposing a state of emergency that bans journalists and charity workers from the immediate border zone. It's also reinforced the area with thousands of troops and legalized pushbacks, even in the case of women and children. I am invested in the case of children at the border. If we don't change our attitude towards these children, they will die, she said. And this is coming from someone who saw, yeah. who saw a lot of that in, in person and knows the, the horrors of that. And I mean, you could argue that that's what her entire 94 years on earth has been. Like yeah. where she was a soldier at such a young age and going about it and now working as somebody who keeps watch over the at the cemetery of the remains. Like her entire life has been focused around this solitary issue and to see it not just in Poland, but these type of far right ideologies popping up all over the place. It's got to be sickening. I mean, and you, you even hear yeah. that from World War II veterans here. They're like, I can't believe that I saw a Nazi flag flying in the United States and people didn't go absolutely insane. Like whenever mm -hmm, yeah. Nazi flags are making a comeback here. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't abandon a child in danger. It's shameful to treat the border children that way, she said, recalling the days when as a 12-year-old she witnessed Nazis entertaining themselves by firing at babies. Speaking of the veterans of the uprising, she observed that we are all very old on the verge of death. For us, this situation is a disgrace. We no longer have the strength to take a stand. All we can do is weep. Well, not everyone. Me, I'm not used to crying. I was a soldier, she said, but I regret that I'm so old and frail. So just an absolute ass. trying you to know, remind you people know if of she history. could pick up a machine gun, she would be fucking firing that thing still. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Be crushing she it. Would. Yeah, wildly impressive woman. She I saw that her story was going viral on Twitter this weekend. People were reading about her and being like, holy shit, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and some of the details. If you have time, look up her name and look at some of the details of the things that she was involved in. It'll really give you uh a sense of humility if you think that you are accomplishing something yeah, yeah, shit you think in the you're military. A badass. Just yeah. read this story about a 12 year old girl who has done more than uh, you or I ever will. So that's, yeah. that's pretty, pretty substantial. Let's move on to round number four. We switched it up a little bit. Now we will get into another story that's very sad, but not surprising. And this isn't something that's new. And I think that that is getting framed as the fact that it's new. But even when I was in, I remember there were several families who were on food stamps and food assistance mm -hmm. but while they were in. There's plenty of young enlisted women who were on um, WIC, which is women, infants, and children, where you're able to go to grocery stores and get milk and egg and cheese and bread and things like that that are staples for your and fruits and things like that that can be expensive for some folks that was happening then but it's happening more and more now with inflation reaching what just what people are saying at 6.9 percent even over the last year it's becoming more and more real and when i was in california there's sometimes where being in texas can kind of cloud your judgment about how much things cost one is real estate and two is like gasoline Whenever I was going out to California and stopping and seeing gas was at $4.60 a gallon, and I'm thinking, sure, there is some cost of living adjustments that take place for the military community. But by and large, if you are, let's say, a staff NCO or a young NCO with a family, you're going to be living a decent distance away from base if you don't get a base housing right away. So th that $4.60 that you're required to drive several times a day through or several times a week with traffic and things like that, even that becomes burdensome of getting to work. Now you're talking about milk going up and milk could be $3.50, $4 a gallon, depending on where you are in the country as well, maybe even more in some parts. So it's there's a lot of issues at place with this, but one that we have to curb is that there's military children who aren't getting enough food. And that's horrific. Yeah. As many as 160,000 active duty military members are having trouble feeding their families. And it's just an estimate by feeding 160,000. Is that what you said? An estimated 160,000. So to put that huh. into perspective, there's 212 active duty Marines right now. That's almost the entirety of the entire Marine Corps. That's 70, if that 212,000. Oh, okay. So yeah, that saying, would yeah. be 75% of all of the active duty Marine Corps. Yeah. Um, so this as it's an estimate by Feeding America, which coordinates the work of more than 200 food banks around the country. The exact scope of the problem is a topic of debate because there's no formal study, but activists say it has existed for years and primarily affects junior level enlisted. So E1 to E4 with children. Um, the group estimates that 29% of troops in the most junior enlisted ranks face food insecurity, insecurity during the previous year. 
It is what it is, says James Bohannon, 34, a Navy E4 in San Diego, who relies on food assistance to keep his two daughters fed. You know what you're signing up for in the military, he said, emerging from a drive through food distro point, but I'm not going to lie, it's really tough. In addition to modest pay for junior enlisted, frequent moves inherent to military life make it difficult for spouses to find steady work. Also, as, but yeah, every two years, you're trying to find a new job and like yeah. it's really difficult for spouses. So a lot of times it's just a one income family and income from E1 to E4 is abysmal, dude. It's less than 40,000. It's way less than the national average for people who work way more than 40 hours a week. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Also, the internal military culture of self-sufficiency leaves many afraid to ask for help for fear they'll be regarded as irresponsible. Yep. The, pro the problem is exacerbated. And I saw that. I, saw, I definitely understand that. The problem is exacerbated by an obscure agricultural agriculture department rule that prevents thousands of needy military families from accessing SNAP government assistance, aka food stamps. It's one of these things the American people don't know about, but it's a matter, of course, among military members. We know this, said Senator Tammy Duckworth. We're the mightiest military on the face of the earth, and yet those who are on the lower rung of our ranks are... If they are married and have a child or two, they're hungry. How can you focus on carrying out the mission and defending our democracy if you're worried about whether or not your kids get dinner tonight? Meredith Knopp, CEO of a food bank in St. Louis and an army veteran, said the problem cuts across all branches. She recalled being a young officer in Texas when she was approached by a new private with a baby. They were getting ready to turn off his electricity because he couldn't pay his bills. It was shocking to me. Perhaps the best indication of how entrenched the problem has become is that a robust network of military adjacent charities like the Armed Services YMCA, Blue Star Families, have developed an infrastructure of food banks near most bases because they know there's people going hungry on the bases. San Diego may be one of the epicenters of this phenomenon with high housing costs and multiple bases with long driving distances, like you're talking about with the gas chaps. For Brooklyn Pittman, whose husband Matthew is of the Navy, the move to California from West Virginia was a financial shock. Ooh. And so that's part of it too. A lot of these people are coming from somewhere in middle America to these major areas where things are way more expensive. Again, I'm not going to go into that too much because you've covered that already, chaps, but it's really, really difficult. Um, one of the strangest aspects of the problem is a mysterious agriculture department regulation that present prevents the food stamps. Families living outside base grounds receive a basic allowance for housing to cover most of their costs. And the Food and Nutrition Act dictates that that allowance counts as income in, ca in, in calculating their eligibility. Yeah, so, so it, basically what yeah. happens if you are an enlisted person or anybody, you have your base pay. And, and this is primarily for the folks, I guess it's for everybody because there's a lot of people in the military that don't know this either. So you have your base pay, which if you go to any of the chart, you can go, I'm an E3, I've been in for five years or six years, and this is how much my base pay is. That's going to be the same for every single E3 who's been in for six years across the board, no matter which branch they're in or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you have pay that goes on top of that, which will be your BAH, your basic allowance for housing. And that will that increases or decreases based on where you live. So if you live in Iowa, your BAH rate is not going to be nearly as much as if you live in Manhattan. So if you're living in Iowa, you might get $1,200 a month. If you're living in Manhattan, you might make 3,200 extra a month, depending on where you live, which sounds great. The problem is this, these formulas were established so long ago that they're not keeping with inflation. So whenever you have something like this and you have somebody that lives in California that's getting $2,800 a month as a gunny, whenever they're getting their BAH, well, that $2,800 that used to be enough for them to live at, a, at the rate that the DOD deems appropriate, now you're looking at your 12, 15% behind in inflation. So they're still trying to maintain the housing that they already have signed up for. They also have increased bills that are going for every single thing because of the way the supply chain works. Gas affects everything. So if you don't have gas, you don't have shit basically in the economy at this point. So they have to make sure that they are increasing it fast enough where it stays with inflation. But I also understand the, the argument that that's a slippery slope. If we continue to increase the amount people are paid, then the prices are going to continue to go up and then mm -hmm. inflation just spirals mm -hmm. out of control. There is no real answer, but the answer should be removing that from <laughs> removing that portion of right. the law and then allow military members who qualify under any other, any other situation to be able to get this. And I think that 
as much as we give lip service to veterans in this country and active duty military members, eating should be the, the bare minimum. Like, yeah, it's a yeah. basic social can, need. Can they eat? Yeah, it's a basic yeah. social need. And, and it's, it's terrible that we would have to jump through so many hoops to, to, to make those changes and put, and put them into effect. And I, I wonder too, I mean, again, like uh, it shouldn't be necessary to, to have more pay because we should be in a place where our members of the military are paid a living wage, regardless of where they're living in the country. But just like if you're in combat, you have additional pay for combat pay. I wonder if we could establish stateside pay incentives where you could get an increase. I don't know if it's based on your job, or if you're based on um, a qualification or a course that you complete. There has to be something where you could, if you choose to, you, you can work harder and, and, and get your pay adjusted in a little bit higher. Yeah, I feel like that that's something like you could talk about bonuses, but I, I feel like that needs to be completely separate from living wage. Yeah, costs. right. No, no, no. Like that's, you, it shouldn't have to come to that. Like I said, it shouldn't have to be like, oh, all right, now I got to go to three other schools just to be able to afford to feed my kids. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just talking about in general, just a way to, to find more money. But also, I you know, I, I think there are other solutions to where you this is just it's I, it breaks my heart that our our folks are not paid well but like for instance if i'm at a base where it requires me to drive i don't know 10 15 miles whatever the distance is every day to and from work well i should be able to maybe expense my gas charges because then if i'm not spending 60 to 150 dollars on gas every week i can then allocate that money elsewhere right so and and god forbid that we tap into the dod budget which is enormous they definitely have the money to do this and it will require a little paperwork on some people's end but i think it's it's a viable option to get people to where they're not just spending and spending and spending and can allocate that money elsewhere i don't yeah, know maybe that's things that, there's certainly things that they can do <laughs> one is just pay people more and yeah respect people for their time and if you want keep good people and have, like the commandant's letter that came out what can we do to keep you um pay me enough for my kids aren't fucking starving that mm -hmm. That's a good, that's a good spot there, sir. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. All right. Let's move on to round number five. We're going to talk about an old, that's not the commandant of the Marine Corps. Oh. And that's there's olds all over the place, but the, there's an epicenter of olds and that's in Washington, DC, notably on Capitol Hill. Yeah. And so this topic came to my attention. Cons put this tweet in the group chat from this, this person who said the average age of a Senator in the U S is 64 years old, which includes five people over the age of 80 and 21 people in their seventies. More than 25% of the U.S. Senate is considered elderly in the United States. So somebody replied, uh, at Big Tits Trader, I didn't mm. notice that until just now, replied, gee, could we put a system in place where people are able to choose who they want to represent them instead? <laughs> like, yeah, no kidding. Um, but And then um, somebody else asked, why does a U.S. president have to be at least 35 years of age? I think many equate age and wisdom with experience. Further, many also believe septuagenarians to be at their peak intellectual levels. I disagree. Studies have shown that most people peak in intelligence at 35. So, so I don't know. If, with that, I'm okay I'm with saying. having I'm I'm okay with having floors for elected officials because yeah, I, I'm sure that there's a crackpot 26 year old who's super smart and could handle making decisions. But by and large, 26 year olds, I don't know that I would trust with them making Shout decisions. Out Madison Cawthorn. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we have some examples here where uh, I am not too comfortable, even though they do meet the age requirements. So I think keeping this, the, the floor on that is, is OK. But I think we need to start figuring something out where I don't care if you can still walk and talk. I, some of these people are simply too old. I'm sorry. They're I don't too old and you can hear them talk and they're supposed to be some of them are attorneys and they don't know shit about the law anymore. Right. Chuck Grassley is, the, I think, the main the best example. He was born in 1933. He first came into office in 1981. Chuck, if you haven't accomplished it since I've been alive, that's 40 years, pal. If you, you haven't doing? accomplished it, well, you're not going to. Yeah. Like if you haven't accomplished it in 40 years as a senator, odds are the next Tom six Thurman, aren't going to give it to you. A uh, little racist <laughs> there, huge, staunch civil rights yeah. opponent. He was still a sitting senator at age 100. OK, to give you any idea. Uh, but so Republican Senator Bill Cassidy finally said something a few weeks ago. Um, he said at some point and statistically it's in the 80s, you begin a more rapid decline. 
And he is a doctor, by the way. So he said, so anybody who's in a position of responsibility who may potentially be on that slope, that's a concern. And I'm saying this as a doctor, he said, they say wisdom comes with age, yet so few of the nation's leaders seem to have the wisdom to know when it's time to call it a day. At 78, President Joe Biden has faced attacks on his mental fitness, as did Donald Trump, who also was very old when he started in 76. Take a cognitive test. Yes. So (laughs) Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, 81. Uh, Mitch McConnell, 79. Cassidy, 64, made it clear he's not singling out anyone in particular, but he wants people to undergo regular cognitive tests. You should single them out. I disagree. Like, it'd be like, all right. Put your little dick skinner high in the sky if you're older than 75. If you are, you better get out. You just got to get out of here. Well, he's saying, would it be reasonable to have for Supreme Court justices, members of Congress, and leadership positions in the executive branch an annual evaluation in which they should have to establish, establish yes, I'm doing okay? Um, he says- But then having the people heard- do it, like there would be all these questions about the folks that did it, like, oh, because Trump, well, the article <laughs> whenever he says went to get yeah. his annual fitness, the, his doctor who looked like an absolute weirdo that would be on like an episode of, um, what's the fuck is that dude? Oh, Louis C.K. show. Like he just looks like he'd be a doctor on a Louis C.K. show talking about Trump is the most physically fit specimen that he's ever, that he's ever examined. I mean, that- it's like- that's just not true. Is yeah, that it's your a very first slippery person? slope and the people can <laughs> Does see he the shit with that ass? If so, I can't be that healthy. <laughs> yeah, and he says like he's heard of uh, senators being senile by the end of their terms. Some 30 states have age-based driver's license renewal requirements. So like once you hit age 70, you have to try taking your test again every year type thing. Um, that standard would apply to nearly 30% of the U.S. Senate. The founders set minimum age limits for serving in the House, Senate, and presidency, but never specified a maximum because life expectancy was mid-30s. And we're never going to get it because the olds won't vote for it. Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Um, So on the other side of the fence, Cassidy is not wrong, says Amanda Littman, who usually disagrees with him on policy. She's a uh, co-founder of Run for Something who recruits and trains young Democrats to run for state and local office. The advanced age of elected officials is a huge problem. It's an open secret and it directly affects the way the government functions. So this this got a lot deeper and more interesting than I thought. Um, The balance of power, one bad slip, those floors are slippery as fuck. Mm. One old in Senate takes a slip on that floor it could crumple a president's agenda or upset the balance of power in the Supreme Court. Yeah, isn't that crazy? That's a good point. No, like, that is true, though. Yeah. That's a weird thing to bring up. But a weird yeah. way to look at but it, like, but it's but, true. Way too but, slippery in here. So they got an ORN in the, uh, the Capitol Hill. But yeah, they both like, those floors oh, too well. And we've and been in there. They're right. But injuries and illnesses that affect the elderly is what is what she's saying. Like, not that's an example, but like when 81-year-old Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont was briefly hospitalized in January... It sent tremors to the Democratic caucus, which could not afford to lose a single member without surrendering their grip on the 50-50 Senate. Because if Diane, you die and you are in the position of a senator and your governor is of the opposite party, they can yes. appoint somebody from their same party to take your spot. Yes. And Diane Feinstein, California, the oldest member of the body at 88, has faced reports of cognitive decline, reportedly forgetting her briefings and repeating herself. Senate and the death of the old affects policy. I mean, we saw that, that with our uh, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg whenever yes. she died. Yeah, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, she went into court well into her 80s rather than stepping aside to allow President Obama to replace her. Then when she died last year during the final months of Trump's term, Ginsburg was replaced by conservative Amy Coney Barrett. Um, the issue is more than just about heightened risk of sudden death tilting the balance of power or a senile leader making bad decisions. Keeping the government in the grip of the oldest generations means that the priorities of younger people who had record turnout in the last two elections frequently get the short end of the stick. And we should also adjust how we do Supreme Court because that shit is it's legitimately crazy. They're asleep during the trials. They can't even (laughs) stay awake for the fucking briefings. I mean, they don't do anything for the most part. And then you basically, in order for the entire process of America, it depends on who dies during which presidential election, like which party's in charge during the presidential election, you happen to die. Like Barack Obama got one, Trump got three people on the, on the court. Mm -hmm. Like to have that in four years versus eight years. How does that make sense? Whenever the popular vote, like the popular vote never comes into effect for the Supreme court, the Supreme court 
that shit's a farce. Like whenever I, when growing up of all the government institutions that you look back now, I would have always said, oh, absolutely. The Supreme Court is completely non-biased. That shit's biased as fuck. Like they're mm-hmm. basically yeah. senators wearing robes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you make a point about eight years though. It's kind of odd that we have term limits for presidents, but for nobody else. So it's, yeah, I guess it's, that, it's, it's not like it's we a gotta wild... blame old fucking Washington for that. Yeah. That was his fault. It's, term it's limits not... was his idea and he didn't incorporate it other places. And the people in charge of changing that don't want there to be term limits because they want to stay there forever, making all their money, doing the little revolving door that they do. So, yeah, but I mean, know. you're there for 30 years. I think you're secure on money at that point. I don't think you need to stick it out for another 10, 15 they years. They don't care. They obviously they think they do need more because they're still there. Yeah. They're, and everything but... in politics now is basically the Maury Povich show. Yeah, like we, it's crazy. When, when you have Elon Musk taking shots at Bernie Sanders, I didn't yeah. know you were still alive. Like, what are we doing here? Like, right, it's like right. Maury. Is that what we've devolved into? What would you <laughs> like say? Elon very Musk. well people. Uh, hey, we- Elon, get more plastic surgery, dude. You look ridiculous. Yeah. You look like a mother. Fun, a cu- couple of fun facts Give for you. Money, um, the youngest person to ever assume the presidency. Do you know who it was? Uh, Roosevelt. Yes, that was JFK. No, so Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt age 42 after William McKinley was assassinated. The youngest to become president by election was JFK at age 43. Oh, that's, so, that's the only thing that counts. Yeah. So chaps like, no, I'm not calling anybody out for age or anything like that. But like, can you imagine now becoming president at your age? <laughs> I think I'd be yeah, fantastic at it. I'd be calm. I think you'd be great. I, w- I would just be like, listen, we're not going to do that. Like, where do I got to go for this conference? Is yeah. there any connection flights? That would be the best part about being president is that I have no connection flights. Yeah, I'm no security like, you, either. True. You take you all my plane. shit, put it where if we're going to Warsaw, put all my stuff in a little baggie. When I get there, we're going to have a, a nice and I would make them call the band my, the president's own. I wouldn't do that. I would just have like the Happy Marine Corps band. That's what we would mm-hmm. call it. It wouldn't be my that's not my band. That's the people's band. Yeah. Can, I, can I say one more thing? Like Joe Biden, he's the oldest president we've ever had. He's 78 years old. Improves it every day. Improves it every day. <laughs> why? Why would you want to be president at that age, man? Go right? sit. Go sit on your porch. Go. Yeah. Go play with your mean dogs. I could see hang out wanting to be president if you were Barack Obama or if you were like George W. Whenever you leave office, you're going to have. 15, 20 years to be post-presidency person in the United States and just yeah. do what, like, you're walking right. around essentially like a king. Like, I could see that being appealing. Having to spend the last, because let's be honest, I legitimately believe Biden will die in office. Like, he's, like it's like not crazy. Like, I think that, he, or very soon thereafter. Why would you want to do that for your la- successful life? Arguably very successful life, senator for so long, People, you were beloved for a long time, and now people, like half the people in the United States hate him just because he has a Democrat or a Republican. That's just the way it goes. But what are you doing with your life? Like, you, mm-hmm. you got, you're going to die, and that's it. Like, yeah. Trump was 70, and he's, so Biden is the, so Trump is the second oldest president we've ever had, and Biden Trump sat by eight years, <laughs> so it's pretty old. Under that, then next was Ronald Reagan at 69. And William there was Henry when Reagan got elected that he was too old to do the job. Right. Yep. He was 69 years old. He was almost 70. Um, William Henry Harrison was 68. And then James Buchanan was the next oldest at 65. And from there, so this is a huge leap um, of over a decade. But the second president, John Adams, they're like, look at this old bitch at 61. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Right now in the House of Representatives, Dan Young, uh, he is 88 years old. He is serving his 25th term for Alaska. That's crazy. So, you know, uh, you know, how old is he? He's been serving the state since it got statehood, pretty much. He that's, started that's not nuts. long after. I mean, <laughs> yeah. he could be the most hip 88 year old there is. Honestly. He saw go, go from Mount Denali back to Mount Denali. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. He and I just don't view the world the same. And and for no other reason that he his life experiences are completely different from mine. And that's the case for so many of these people. I just don't know. And I get, you know, part of it is lazy because, yes, you could have other people run and, and elect them out of there right now. But the fact that these are our best options for the cognitive test. I can see it being weaponized and you and getting pol- political, whatever each member of the Senate should be assigned a TikTok account mm-hmm. and they should have to be able to stay relevant. They should have to be able to use at least three modern day slang terms, two filters, and would have to garner more than 10,000 yeah. likes every yeah, year. Exactly on one of their right, TikToks. Kate, when Thank you. the Senator Blumenthal 
said that he didn't know what a finsta was and was wrong yeah. about being a finsta in the social media impeached i think you gotta get him the fuck out you of there get if the you do out. something embarrassing so wrong on technology or something that's new and modern i think it should be automatic impeachment you don't know what your constituents want at that point with the young no. people voting you don't know what a finsta what are you gonna get do with here. a finsta how are you gonna get a finsta shut up man like mm-hmm. first of all you didn't even go to vietnam and you bragged about that and now you don't know what a finsta is embarrassing kick rocks embarrassing. Uh, all right but last before we move on the best statement does anybody know it off the top of their head the best statement ever on the floor of the united states senate by somebody who is 75 years or older oh what kate any guesses was it a queef? I'm too, I'm no, too drunk queef, to taste this queef, chicken. Gooden. Cons, mm-hmm. any guesses? You're, you too, went to West Point. You should know. You guys studied a lot of U.S. history. I was going to say I'm too drunk to taste this chicken. No, that wasn't him. That was KFC. That was the colonel. Um, um, what about you, Nick? Any guesses? No idea. One of my favorite speeches on the floor of the Senate. It's old ass Robert Byrd, um, who's a former senator from <laughs> North Carolina. And whenever he, or West Virginia, whenever he was on the Senate floor, I don't even remember the context, but I remember seeing it was one of the very first Barstool sports articles I ever seen. Then Dave blogged it and he's up there and he's like, barbaric. It's simply barbaric. Let that word resound from hilltop to hilltop, from valley to valley. Barbaric. <laughs> I love it. What was he I talking just, about? What was he talking I, about? I have no idea. The training of these poor creatures to turn themselves into fighting machines is simply barbaric. Barbaric. Barbaric! Barbaric! Let that word resound from hill to hill and from mountain to mountain, from valley to valley, across this broad land, barbaric. Let that word resound from hilltop to hilltop, from valley to valley. People don't even talk like that anymore. (laughs) Nothing resounds anymore. The queefs. Well, how to quiff about it? How to quiff in my pantaloons? That's uh, Julia Stiles. That was my best bugger y'all. All All right, let's move on to Save Rounds and Alibis, which today is going to be presented by our good friends at BetterHelp. If you haven't tried out BetterHelp, you need to make sure you're checking them out. They have the Gold Star Family Initiative that they partner with with us, where if you're a Gold Star Family member from the Global War on Terrorism, they're going to take care of your therapy. Just go to betterhelp.com slash gold star to get started with that. They're going to ask you for just a little bit of documentation to prove that you are one of the people who meet the criteria. It's super easy process. And if you have problems with it, if there's any issues, DM me at Twitter at Uncle Chaps and we'll, I'll help you get it sorted out. Same thing goes if you're having trouble getting the discount going. Go to betterhelp.com slash zero or ZBT and you're going to get 10% off your first month of service. They have it if you want to talk to somebody over the phone, if you want to do it text, if you want to have video. They have so many different ways to get your therapy done. But Everybody who I've talked to who has started therapy after thinking, should I do this? If you're thinking, should I go to therapy? The answer is absolutely unequivocally yes. You're, you don't have to wait to the point where that's why I call going to a therapist, going to the brain dentist. You don't have to wait until you need all of your teeth extracted to go see one. If you're feeling like you just need a little brain cleaning, go talk to a therapist. They're going to help you out big time. That's betterhelp.com. We could not recommend them enough. Let's move on to some save rounds and alibis. Nick, we'll start with you. Yep. Uh, just a follow up to the Christmas lights. I got mine installed this weekend. I thank you. I regret nothing. Um, if anything, I would have done more. I had instant regret that I didn't add a wreath, another wreath to the right hand side and did some garland around my pillars. So, um, and I'm, I'm like the third person on the block to get it done. So two other people on the same day had theirs up. So I don't feel uh-huh. like Really work I, I, special. That's what they call that in the business. Yes, yeah, so I'm very excited to just have them up for a very elongated amount of time. Strong, strong recommend. 
I like well it. Well done, Nick. I put our we put our Christmas tree up yesterday. Wild. And it, and it was lovely. It's just <laughs> lovely. Last I, I year know, guys, like you guys want to shit all. on me for opening my gifts early? You that's what I was gonna say. After, yes, yes. Uh, after it's Halloween. Halloween. Uh, September, Kate. Okay? Mm. There's a drastic difference a week in September of getting yeah, all your presents. That's a good point. That's yeah, a, you tried to claw point. back there, Kate, but you should not you said no and I wasn't gonna let you get away. We did two more gifts this weekend. I mean, what are you doing? Zoo. You know what? You're not doing Christmas. You guys are just Zoo exchanging membership. gifts. You guys are just doing just, exchanging just gifts, which is fall fine. Festival. That's what they're having. It's a fall yeah. festival. At you the- guys are just running gift exchange at the Mannion <laughs> household. That's exactly right. Cool. Uh, Con, what do you got? That's not Christmas. Yeah, I, I just wanted that. You got Nick putting up the Christmas lights. You're putting up, which I can only imagine is a fake tree because you can't keep a real tree alive for two months. Yeah, I'll never get a real tree. Yeah, never I get mean- a real tree. Real <laughs> trees suck. Hate, hate Why? And I, I, it smells and I amazing. also value the environment cons. Right. Oh, they, they, the folks a big tree don't care cons. You yeah. guys, I, I, I didn't Somebody realize. Somebody like oxygen. I had no idea. Wow. Yeah, they replace a tree every every time they cut one down, so I don't want to hear it. Mm, what would they do if they, they just planted more and we kept the ones that we had? Yeah. Well, you ever have baby ticks living in your tree? Have no, you not seen all the people that are shaving lines down the middle of their heads just to stand with the deforestation of the Amazon cons? Mm-hmm. No. I don't care about that. We don't get our Christmas trees from the Amazon, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. nevertheless, oh, I didn't, re- not, I didn't not, realize not anymore. No, I didn't realize I was three V one here against, you know, having Christmas in December, like a normal person and just doing Christmas year round and just devaluing Christmas. Oh, Christmas sorry, is we pretty much bad, over bad, like a little fucking Christmas sheep. We, we march to the beat of our own little drummer boy. Yeah. That's fine. You. But you're just devaluing it for your kids and your families. It's unbelievable. They're going to just yeah, can't expect from the Christmas. Guy whose favorite Christmas song is dominant. The donkey real rich. No, it's not. And then, you know what, you know what else, Kate, you know what you're really Jiggity creating? Jig. Kate, you know what you're creating for yourself? <laughs> jig indeed. You know what you're creating for yourself, Kate? You're creating yourself a, a, a huge problem because now it's going to be Tuesday uh, in July her. and your kids can be like, hey, mom, where's my gift? Your kid's going to expect gifts all year round now. And it's just a little ridiculous. But hey, if you want to give your kid gifts year round, have at it. Be my guest. But that's why I'm a cool mom. So, yeah. Mm. Yep. As seen I'm getting told today. I'm getting told from the other room. I'm getting told from the other room, dude, you actually sound like a douche. It's not funny. So I guess my Christmas takes ah, I love, I are love four her versus so one. Much. I love her so much. Alex is always right. She's, Alex is the best. That's the reason why yeah. I'm sitting on her side at the wedding. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yep. Oh, and then lastly, Kate, I saw you had a, a plea today on social media for some help. And I, I want to get you the help you need. And I think I would go talk to like, Casey, because she's got like the athleisure wear thing. Down, That's who I, think. I was trying to look like, Hans. Okay, today. So, yes. I That's think the you reason go Casey. I. I well, no, I, no, no, no. I wouldn't go Casey. I think there needs to be some adaptation from her style. To that make would it be jarring. Fitting. If yeah. Kate came in and was just dressing like Casey, I think it would be. I think it'd be a little too much, too fast. Yeah, it would. I, I, you could easily <laughs> pull off Erica's style. She's like wearing Erica high wears. heels. I, Erica wears heels and shit. Eric's no, pretty I can't. eclectic. She's blazers, jeans, high heels. Yeah, but Kate could be eclectic. No. Kate, Kate would crush that. No, Kate, I, you wear I, heels? I, I think Kate could come right. into Kate could come into work with a big old hoodie on that just says weed across the top. Why can't <laughs> Kate wear that? I can't wear the shoes that Erica wears, and I don't like blazers. Dress like stuff. David. Just get some super tight jeans. Dude, you you I, only I, have to wear your blazer you probably wear the same you size to, your, to your desk, and then you take yeah. it off. Listen, Kate, I, I think know. I think we have a sufficient amount of folks that we're partnered with that you could get the clothes that you're looking for. I think you're almost there. I, I think you, you're going for like a comfortable fit, but a little more stylish and not looking like their sweatpants that have been in your closet for six months. So I think there's a happy medium that we could find for you. And while Kate, while Khan's is critiquing you, Kate, I'll just say you look lovely in whatever you're doing and you're doing great. Thank you. I, I think you look fine, Kate, but nope, if you're looking no, for something else, now, I'm happy to help. Kate, what do you have for your save round? What do I have? So after the episode we had where we had the Hunter 7 Foundation on, we were talking about toxic exposures and how it's a huge detriment if you are a VA vet, if you're a veteran and you're not registered at your VA. And I felt like such a hypocrite because I was not registered at my local VA. Oh, I thought um, you were going to say because we spend uh, two hours a week with toxic cons. True. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, oh, anti I guess we're not toxic saying Christmas cons. these days. I guess we're. No, we are. After wow. Thanksgiving. Um, after Thanksgiving. But so I set up an appointment um, in New Jersey. I didn't even know where mine was located, um, but I found there's a smaller satellite campus near me 
I got a new, I haven't had a primary care provider because I totally ghosted on my pregnancy doctors. Uh, after I had the baby, I just never went back. You really like, taught right, them a lesson. You. Yeah, I just, I'm got gone. I never, um, so I haven't had any, like I had one follow-up checkup after the baby, that's it. Postpartum, feel, that can't be a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no thanks. I was like, I'm not driving into the fucking city for this. Anyway, um, anyway, I, I don't think I can remember the last time I had, a, I got assigned a new primary care provider and she was, they, they were able to see me really quickly. She sat and, and I said to her, here's the places I was deployed. I am concerned about toxic exposures. How can we be proactive about just making sure we're keeping tabs on this? Um, and here's some other things I'm concerned about. And she said, you're not leaving here until we're signed up for the burn pit registry for you um, until we have um, all sorts of different appointments were made, blood work. I went back this morning and got a second thing of blood work. Um, and so they- Good for you, Kate. That's great. I know, which is super rare for me. We're getting taken care of all sorts of different things. I have all sorts of appointments lined up. I'm going to get a handle on this. And if I can do it, if you're out there thinking, because it feels overwhelming when you're a mess of a person, which is what I am. If I could do it, you could do it. The I will say, because annoying, I'm not but... going to let this devolve into what it happened last so show where you just shit on yourself for basically yeah. 30 minutes at the end. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> I think you're going <laughs> in the right direction. You ha- are doing so much better than you did previously like you do take this stuff seriously like you you're taking care of your son you're doing your appointments yeah. you're getting after your medical shit even though you are being self-deprecating huge growth for you in the last really oh. two years dude total absolutely really truly and being a mom has been a huge part of that like i thought i was going to be a mess but i actually like myself as a mom better than i've liked myself in a long time i mean uh, taking so. care of all the bottles still doing like feeding them and doing all the different things that you're doing with that like that shit's going to be commendable, Kate. Like I'm going to pump my tits in here the second this show is done. Fuck and, yeah. and working and, and working too. Yeah. And working, and working. Yeah. being a working mom. You're anyway, doing great. we got to gas, gas me up. up. So. Gas me up. Gas, gas, right. gas, gas. Oh, anyway. So, you know what else? Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll say this out loud. And, and I, I don't know. If, I don't know if he listens. Go. I don't know if he listens, but I hope he hears this. You tell Brandon Walker to kick rocks. Cause that, mm. that, that dude, he thinks he gets a nice haircut and all of a sudden he's some fashion icon. Get the hell out of here, Brandon. I, I love you, guy. I think he's awesome. No, I have no problems cool with dad. Brandon. He's, he's a, a cool, cool dad. dad. He has cool shoes. He's got uh, good hair. No, fun listen, shirts. listen, I have yet once to see a worm Brandon. farmer, always a worm farmer. That's yeah. what I say. Correct. Correct. Right. And I've yet to see Brandon have one amazing outfit to wear. I've, I've never seen him with a worm. I think he's got worm stolen valor. Yeah, he I, he doesn't have a leg to stand on when it comes to giving you gruff about well, it. You ever seen a worm in his pocket? Not once. Not once. Not a worm. Makes you so. think. That. Yep. Um, my save round I want to talk about one UTSA 10 and 0, baby. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Even though that game cons, you would have lost your shit. Even mm, yeah. my wife is probably I was watching three games, maybe three games the last 10 years. Even she go in the middle of the third quarter, there's a delay game. She's like, What the fuck is going on with Southern Miss? That's gotta be the fifth <laughs> delay game. Like, that's gotta be a record. And yep. I thought I was like, that might be a record. They had 16 penalties and eight. During the one game, eight delay of game penalties. That's not good. I've never seen that before on any level, even Pee Wee. I've never seen that shit. Well, like, it gets pretty loud in there at the Alamo Dome, right? Yeah, but you're they're not even running plays that where you're adjusting at the line. All they because they're running back. That's why the game was so close. Wow. All they had was their running back running the wildcat the whole time, and they didn't prepare for it because the quarterback got injured. So it was just a a weird offense that they had to stop that they didn't have any tape on or anything like that. So it was, it was, that was weird, but being in there with my kid was fucking great. Oh, the, got, with all the lights flashing, it looked like they're having the best Oh yeah. Time. They've made huge improvements and being able to see my kid have a great time and all that they, McCartney always thinks it's beyond cool with this job when people will come up and say, can I take a picture? And McCartney's like, oh, that guy's a fan. No. <laughs> I'll be like, I guess so. Yeah. Like, That's pretty cool. Maybe one day people will ask to take my picture out in public. So to all of you that came out and saw it, I saw several ZBT listeners. Thanks for saying what's up. One of the guys was like, I felt so bad of, of saying hello to you in, in front of your family and interrupt your family. So I'm like, no, they fucking love it. I think it's cool. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. conversely, conversely for me up at West Point Games, you know, people are like, hey, what's up? Da, 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 da. And I, I very much appreciate it. But everyone in my family and my friends that I brought or bring always were like, dude, you're a loser. So what a that's douche. The, yeah. <laughs> so it's nice that you get that reception from your friends and family because I sure as hell don't. Yeah, well, people like me, Cons. That's the difference. Oh. So 
I'm just kidding. About it. No, you're not. Con. And the no, second you're thing not. I want to say before I have to go do an interview, I want to say this. One, there's been a lot of three chi drama that's been going on in Texas where the Texas legislators tried to stop Delta 8 from being legal. The a judge has issued an injunction saying that it is going to be legal until there's a full hearing on it. That being said, in Texas, starting on October 1st, I believe was the date, marijuana is legal for veterans who have a PTSD or traumatic brain injury diagnosis. Um, you can search different dispensaries around Texas. There's only two, but there's a couple doctors that if you have a diagnosis from the VA or even your PCM, whoever that might be, and you can get it, that they can get medical marijuana here as well. And there's a lot of doctors that are starting to do it and they're starting to realize that it is beneficial to a lot of us. So one of them, um, there's several in San Antonio. And if you are having trouble finding one in Texas, hit me up and I'll help you find one of those because I am a firm believer in it. Honestly, 3G, and I've talked about it before, this isn't even an ad that we have, but medical cannabis for, for me has really helped change my life. I mm -hmm. drink far less. I take less anxiety, less antidepressants, all those things because I'm getting solid sleep because of cannabis. Which I feel like is you're in fantastic. a better mood too, honestly. Like you're in a goofier, like funnier, like not goofy or funny, but like you, I don't know. I, I can see the difference that it's made in a great way. So yeah, so I, I've been very happy with it. So I encourage other people to do that same thing. We'll be back here on Friday with another episode. We're going to have a fantastic interview, which I'm about to record right now with one of the dudes who uh, did a lot on the ground with the Taliban the very first week of operations there in Afghanistan in October of 2001. And then he went on and now he's interviewed some of the highest levels of Taliban officials that they have. And he did that just weeks before the withdrawal was about to happen. So we're going to have him on and talk about that. You're going to hear all that on Friday. Can't wait for it. It's on the retreat.